Today's episode is brought to you by our good friends at Mountain Rose Herbs. The folks at Mountain Rose Herbs are committed to providing us herbalists with high quality, organic, and sustainable herbs, spices, essential oils, bulk ingredients, and much more. But quality isn't the only thing they're passionate about. They consider the environmental and social impact of every business decision they make and are dedicated to keeping their business practices sustainable and ethical from start to finish. To Mountain Rose Herbs, people, plants, and planet are more important than profit. And Herb Rally Podcast listeners can get 15% off their order at mountainroseherbs.com using coupon code 22RALLY15. That's 22RALLY15, all one word. So a huge thanks to Mountain Rose Herbs for sponsoring the podcast, and don't forget to use coupon code 22RALLY15 to get 15% off your next order. Now on to the show. Enjoy. A little bit of housekeeping before we get into the show. The content in this podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only. It is not intended to cure, diagnose, treat, or prevent any disease. This information has not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. We are not doctors, nor do we play one on the internet. Please seek advice from a qualified healthcare professional. Okay, MC Calico, take it away. Yeah. Smoking herbal blends. We need some mullin and some kush, my brethren. While listening to Herb Rally podcast again. Herbalism at its finest with Mason Hutchinson. Yeah. A leaf, a flower, and a fruit. Herbal motifs in the ancient Mediterranean. Part 1. The leaf motif featuring figs. Have you ever picked fresh figs straight from the tree? Their sweet taste is addictive and delectable. A few years ago when I was in Greece, I ate an entire bowl of freshly picked figs for breakfast and was satisfied in both appetite and joy. The funny thing about figs is that if you take a close look at how they droop from their stem, it can remind you about a part of the male anatomy. I am certainly not the first to think of this. Both the leaf fluttering on the tree and the juicy hanging fruit had special roles in ancient Mediterranean history. Notably, the contradictory associations with sin and shame, or sexual expression and masculinity. These were associations that stretch as far back as the beginning of time. Today we will explore the leaf motif of the fig tree, as well as its undoubtedly popular fruit. To begin, let me introduce myself. My name is Maria Christodoulou, and I'm a clinical herbalist exploring the wisdom and whimsy of ancient Greek herbal medicine. As the Greek herbalist, I research and write about plants depicted in fantastical myths, ancient scientific writings, and artistic representations that have survived for thousands of years. This session is the first in a series of three that explores herbal motifs in the ancient Mediterranean region. I'll be exploring a leaf, a flower, and a fruit. Please join me for all three. Before exploring the history of how the fig leaf became a symbol of sin and shame, let's first briefly explore the history of the pendulous fruit and its delectable leaves in daily ancient life. Figs were a staple of ancient Greek, Roman, and Egyptian cuisine. They grew abundantly throughout the region and were included in countless recipes, from breakfast to dessert to wine. The Roman cookbook collection of Apicius called De Reconquinaria, translated to the art of cooking, provided countless meat, fish, and sauce recipes with figs. In ancient Rome, figs were instrumental in fattening up livestock before slaughter. One of these recipes included the strange sounding recipe for fig fed pork, in which live pigs were first starved and then overly fed with dried figs. The desired result was obtaining abnormally large livers, although the pigs died from indigestion. There was even a Latin term for it called ficatum, which translated to fig-stuffed liver. This was linked to the common practice of fattening geese or other livestock with figs so that their livers were tastier and fattier. We know now that these succulent fruits are high in carbohydrates that the body absorbs quickly, and in doing so, enlarges the liver. 
A bit earlier in time, in the 4th century BCE, the ancient Greek food writer Archistratus recommended a much more mild incorporation, and this time using the leaves. In his recipe, the leaves were wrapped around fresh tuna fish and baked under hot ashes, which he says was the absolute best way to cook the fish. The ancient Egyptians, unlike their counterparts in ancient Greece and Rome, did not write any recipe books about their cuisine until medieval times. Instead, they beautifully illustrated the methods of some of their recipes on the walls of Pharaoh's tombs. They made a popular pastry akin to today's Fig Newton bars, a dessert which is still made in that region for religious holidays. While we can still enjoy the taste of figs in countless modern recipes, our perception of the plant has consi considerably changed over time. No better exemplified than the motif of the fig leaf throughout history. From all the leaves available, why was the fig leaf chosen as the preferred method for genital cover-up? Might it be that the ancient people's sense of humor identified the similarity between plant and man? Perhaps it had something to do with the doctrine of signatures? While we may never know the true origin, we can certainly explore its sensual history. There are countless stories about the fig leaf's association with sex, sin, and censorship. It appeared in the book of Genesis in the Old Testament, with Adam and Eve covering themselves as they each became ashamed of their own nudity. And the same motif of the leaf was used centuries later in medieval Italy in the 1500s. During this time, the Catholic Church launched a fig leaf campaign. This was a crusade to cover up marble sculptures whose male genitalia were visible. A notable example is Michelangelo's famous fully nude sculpture of David. This sculpture was completely scandalous when it was unveiled in Florence. Shortly after, it was appropriately covered with a garland of bronze fig sleeves. And David was not the only sculpture that was covered. The campaign targeted godly nude male figures with precisely the cover-up that Adam had used many centuries earlier in order to protect people from what they shouldn't see. It was an effort to quell sexual expression. This same censorship was evident even many years later. An artist in the 1960s had been expelled from Catholic school for defacing its classical statues by painting their fig leaves red. And the effort to remove fig leaves continues today. Just this past February, the BBC published a video entitled, What You Find When You Remove a Fig Leaf. This short video mentions the complex relationship between Christianity and sex in classical artwork. Mary Beard, a celebrated classicist and historian, is seen in the video working with the curator to chisel away the single fig leaf covering the genitalia on a statue of Apollo, the Greek god of music and healing. According to her, the fig leaf was in a sense counterproductive, as it was an eye-catching element to the sculpture, a sort of distraction to imagine what was behind the leaf. As she says, it was a symbol that said, come, look at what you can't see. I recommend watching the video for the final unveiling of what was behind it. In addition to sculptures, paintings were also scrutinized in the Catholic Church's fig leaf campaign. Any paintings that illustrated nude men or women were painted over with fig leaves to make the scene more decent and proper. This included the famous painting of the creation of Adam in the Sistine Chapel. And it is only in fairly recent times that the paintings have been restored to their original bounty. Luckily, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel was spared the Catholic cover-up crusade. Pardon the interruption, the show will be back on shortly. People will sometimes say, Mason, how can I support you and your work? There is so much free content on Herb Rally and it'd be nice to give back somehow. I used to say, please rank and review the show. It means the world to us. 
which is still great. Please rank and review in your podcast player of choice. Uh, but now I'd say becoming an Herb Rally Schoolhouse member is one of the best ways you can support our small family herbal business. If you've ever heard of Patreon, it's kind of like that. Uh, basically, you're directly supporting our work by spending $10 a month and becoming a member of the Herb Rally Schoolhouse, or patron, if you will. Membership includes exclusive content, and we release new content each week. And the library of available content just keeps growing over time with a variety of teachers and classes, which means the schoolhouse just keeps offering more, adding more value to you as you continue on your herbalist journey. There's also a bunch of discounts for cool herbal businesses in there as well, uh, plus some other features to the membership. So if you'd like to check it out and get your first 30 days for free, you can use coupon code PODCAST when you register at herbrelly.com slash schoolhouse. Again, that's herbrelly.com slash schoolhouse and use coupon code PODCAST at checkout to get your first 30 days for free. Thanks so much for your time and support. Now back to the show. While fig leaves played their role in covering up genitalia, fig fruits had a completely different story. A story that is perhaps the complete opposite includes that of the Roman senator Cato the Elder in 150 BCE. He played a joke during a speech to his fellow senators. According to the Greek historian Plutarch, quote, as he ended this speech, it is said that Cato shook out the folds of his toga and contrived to drop some Libyan figs on the floor of the Senate House. And when the senators admired their size and beauty, he remarked that the country which produced them was only three days sail from Rome. End quote. Putting aside for a moment the fact that Cato's speech was aimed at starting a war, a war with ancient, ancient Carthage, his boldness and brashness to drop the figs from under his toga clearly demonstrate the association of figs with a certain type of ancient manliness. Unlike the motif of fig leaves to censor and enforce purity, the fruit symbolized a contradictory statement to poke fun using a sexual and masculine expression. There is little doubt that a politician today would ever consider such a crude joke on the Senate floor, let alone on any public platform. But the story of Cato continues. The war that he started with his fig joke on the Senate floor was called the Third Punic War. This was the war that destroyed the great and powerful city of Carthage, which is in present-day Tunisia. Pliny the Elder, a philosopher and naturalist, later reflects on this scene and exclaims, quote, The thing, however, that is the most astonishing of all, indeed, I can conceive nothing more truly marvelous, is the fact that a city thus mighty, the rival of Rome for the sovereignty of the world during a period of 120 years, owed its fall at last to an illustration drawn from a single fig." End quote. This is the incredulous power of the fig fruit, exemplified in the destruction of an ancient city. There is more to read about Pliny's descriptions of figs during other key historical moments. In his book Naturalis Historia, or Natural History, he has an entire chapter devoted to stories about the fig, entitled historical anecdotes connected with the fig. This book is also a treasure trove of herbal remedies and other plant narratives that I would recommend you explore. So to recap, the fig leaf was a popular symbol of censorship demonstrated as early as Adam and Eve and later by the decades long fig leaf campaign in medieval Italy. This was a time when sexuality was a sin and nudity was obscene. A contradictory symbol on the very same tree was the fig fruit, which symbolized the free expression of sexuality and masculinity. And what about the entirety of the fig tree? There is indeed much to say about the tree, which was full of mythical and religious meanings. To the ancient Romans, it was connected to the myth of their founding fathers, Remus and Romulus. 
The twin baby brothers were supposedly found on the banks of the Tiber River directly under a fig tree. The Latin botanical name Ficus ruminalis, a type of wild fig tree, may have been named in honor of the brother Romulus. In ancient Greece, the fig tree was associated with several myths involving gods and goddesses. One myth recounts the creation of the fig tree when the earth goddess Gaia transformed her mortal son, Sicius, into the very first fig tree. In modern Greek, the word for fig tree is Sikya, a word derived from the name of Gaia's son. In later Greek mythology, the figs would be associated with Dionysus, or Bacchus as he was known in Roman mythology. Dionysus was the god of wine, ecstatic pleasure, and celebration, so his association with figs should not come as a surprise, especially given that the phallus and related imagery were also associated with them. In ancient Egypt, the common fig tree was the ficus sycamorus. Dried figs from this tree were buried with pharaohs in an effort to sustain them on their journey to the afterlife. The Egyptian mother goddess Hathor, who lived in a fig tree, was expected to welcome them into heaven. There are also important cultural associations in India, Sri Lanka, Indonesia, and Barbados. The early Vedic people sang about the tree in battle hymns. Some cultures in Asia associated the tree with power, fertility, and with places of prayer, notably the Indian banyan. Ficus bengalensis, which grows impressively expansive. The Buddha was supposedly sitting under a banyan fig tree when he obtained enlightenment. And afterwards, the Indian Emperor Ashoka took a branch from this very tree and bestowed upon it kingship, a story told in the Mahavamsa, an epic poem about the history of Sri Lanka. The fig tree mentioned in this story is identified as Ficus religiosa. For much more on the rich folklore of the Ficus genus, there is a fairly recent book called Gods, Wasps, and Stranglers, The Secret History and Redemptive Future of Fig Trees by Mike Shanahan. This book details how figs have nourished our bodies and fed our imaginations over millions of years. and how the trees can support our future in a time of depressing climate change. It seems that the entire fig tree has enjoyed a rich and varied history of pleasure and pain. Today, it does not carry such a heavy load of shame and sin, but it does continue to please our palates in tasty culinary dishes. With more than 750 fig species, the tree provides a staple food in many cultures, for people and animal alike. The nutritional facts are numerous, with the fruit, leaf, and bark beneficial to health. Fig fruits, which are actually both, or neither, fruit or flower, are high in dietary fiber and the mineral manganese. They are nutritive, demulcent, and laxative, commonly used to relieve constipation. Phytochemical compounds in the leaves and bark have been shown to be effective against bacteria, parasites, and tumors. In ancient Greece, the leaves were compared to crow's feet and have been used for diabetes, high cholesterol, and skin conditions such as psoriasis and eczema. And the milky sap of the tree has been applied externally to soften skin conditions including calluses and warts. From a religious campaign to cover up the glory of man to a war campaign started by it. The next time you meet a fig tree, be sure to acknowledge the tumultuous journey of the leaf and the whimsical role of the fruit. More importantly, I encourage you to remember that our imaginations truly have the power to change history. Thanks for joining me in this three-part series exploring herbal motifs in the ancient Mediterranean. While I poked fun at the historical imagery of the fig tree in this session, 
Join me for the next one in which I get sensual and sentimental with the celebrated rose flower. Of course, for all other adventures through antiquity, you can also join me at thegreekherbalist.com. And that's going to do it for today's episode. Thanks so much for listening to the Herb Rally podcast. If you'd like to hear more from us here at Herb Rally, we now have a text message community, believe it or not. Basically, it's just updates from us. We send about one to seven texts per week, uh, notifying you about new events, videos, courses, podcasts. You get the idea. It's pretty much like our email newsletter, just in text form. So if you'd like to receive text messages from Herb Rally, just text JOIN, that's J-O-I-N, to the number 541-256-2895. Again, that's JOIN to number 541-256-2895. And to stop receiving texts, that's easy too. Just text STOP to the same number. It'll opt you out immediately. Okay, thanks again for listening. Have a great rest of your day.